Thank you. Uh, it feels very odd to stand up here. I feel like I'm very high up. So um, I don't normally stand this high up. And in fact, one of the lessons I will tell you about, story, bless you, uh, I will tell you about storytelling at some point here is that um, you should try not to stand high up. It feels very awkward. But it's good for the camera, so I'll stand up here. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be here. It's, uh, when I came in, I decided that I would like to come back here and uh, participate in the school and teach at the school because this whole, uh, the craft of storytelling is something that has become uh, you know, really fashionable, I think, over the last five years or so. But it's great to see that the, you know, the, the school was set up long before it became fashionable. Uh, so uh, it's, it's really excited to be here. I'm going to try and go through my content quite quickly and leave time for hopefully lots of questions. But three chapters to my story that I would like to share with you today. One is why, why I think stories are important, why lots of people are talking about stories and storytelling uh, over the last few years. A little bit of a history of storytelling at Microsoft and the work that I've been involved in. And then maybe some of the, uh, not, maybe not the secrets, but some of the things that we've learned at Microsoft over the last four or five years as we've started to build the storytelling discipline at the company. Um, first of all, a little bit about me. Uh, this is my email address if you ever want to send me email or ask me questions. Or uh, this is me on Twitter. If you want to send me odd photos on Twitter, you're welcome to. Um, I'm originally from the UK, born in the UK, uh, born in a place called Liverpool uh, that has a rich history of playing football in this city. So I'm a Liverpool football fan. I will be watching the game tomorrow against Everton. Um, I spent the day earlier talking to some, uh, some friends from Juventus, which was great. And I never started out as to be a storyteller. I never, uh, my career was never planned this way. I, I'm an accidental storyteller. Uh, in fact, I won't, I won't, maybe I'll tell you the story later, but I was a complete recruitment accident at Microsoft. Microsoft thought they were hiring a different guy called Steve, and they ended up hiring me. And it wasn't until the day that I started at Microsoft that they realized that they were actually thought they were hiring a different Steve. So the whole thing is just one big, giant, happy accident. Um, it's a very long and funny story. I'll tell you maybe some other time. But I studied computer studies. I studied at a university in England called Loughborough, which my friends in America call Luga Baruga because they haven't figured out how to spell Loughborough. Um, and I joined Microsoft about 18 years ago, nearly 19 years ago. Uh, and I joined as a technical salesperson. So I'd spend all of my time with big companies in London uh, selling them technology. And then about nine years ago, eight or nine years ago, I started to tell stories about Microsoft as a hobby. Um, I was really frustrated with the way the company was perceived and misunderstood. And so I started to write a blog about Microsoft. Uh, I had a day job, but I would spend most of my time writing the blog. And the company, Microsoft, knew I was writing the blog. Uh, and I used to just write stories about cool things that I thought were happening in Microsoft or cool things that people were do, doing with Microsoft technology. And then about six years ago, uh, the guy, the man who runs communications for all of Microsoft. So Microsoft is now a 120,000 person organization. Uh, and there's a guy called Frank Shaw, who's now my boss. And he runs communications for the company. And six years ago, on a Tuesday, actually, uh, I was at home in London, and the phone rang. And I, don't, I didn't really know this guy, Frank, who ran communications for the company. And I answered the phone, and it was Frank. And he said, Steve, it's Frank Shaw. And I said, oh, hello, Frank. And he said, um, he said I'd like to talk to you about your blog. I thought, oh, shit. <laughs> this is the day I'm going to get fired. Uh, and in fact, Frank said, um, I said, well, what would you like to know, Frank? He said, well, I really like your blog. I think it's, you know, you have a real passion for telling stories about Microsoft. So, I think, you should, uh, I think you should move to Seattle and do that as a full-time job. And I said, wow, uh, OK. And uh, I, I paused the phone for a moment, and I turned to my wife. And I said, I think I've just been offered my dream job, but hang on for a second. And I went back to the phone, and I said to Frank, tell me more about this, Frank. Are you, are you going to pay me to do this? <laughs> he said, yes, I'm going to promote you and pay you. I'm like, fantastic. So I go back to my wife. I'm like, yes, it's, it's the dream job but it might require us to move to Seattle, hang on. So I go back to the phone. Frank, does this job require me to move to Seattle? Yes, it does, Steve. Honey, we're moving to Seattle. 
And three months later, well, uh, six weeks later, we got married because it's easier to move to America if you're married. Uh, we got married, and then uh, three months later, we moved to Seattle. And for the last six years, I've been telling stories about Microsoft. Um, so that, uh, that's my job. That's how I got this job title of chief storyteller. And a little bit about some of this stuff is, it will be very obvious to this group, so I'll go through it very quickly. But this, I think, is the reason that stories and storytelling have become more and more popular in the last few years. A friend of mine drew this cartoon a few years ago. He's a great storyteller. He's a visual storyteller, a guy called Hugh McLeod. He has a blog and a website called Gaping Void. Uh, you should check out Gaping Void. He does phenomenal stories through the medium of cartoons. And Hugh wrote this cartoon really to explain that we all now live in this world where there's just too much information. We're under attack. We are bombarded with information. TV, radios, websites, books, newspapers, blogs, information is everywhere. But when you go home this evening or you go out with friends this weekend, you won't sit down in a bar or a restaurant and somebody, people, people don't do this. They don't say, let's go to a bar and have a drink because I have some information I'd like to share with you. People don't do that. We don't share data. We tell stories. And you guys know this. We, we've grown up as a species uh, to tell stories. You know, people used to sit around campfires and tell stories. Now they sit in bars and restaurants and tell stories. And so when we see our friends, we tell stories because they're memorable. We tell stories about a book we read, a movie we saw, a holiday we went, a journey we took. Uh, and people take those stories from us and they translate those stories, they reinterpret them, they embellish those stories, and they tell them to other people. And that's how stories have been handed down and passed around through time. It's why, you know, in the evening, for those of us who have children, we read stories to our children. It's part of what we do. And that's why in this world of just a density and so much information, the deluge of information, that's why I think stories have, over the last few years, become more and more important, because stories are sticky. Stories are remembered, good stories are, are told well and remembered by people and passed on and shared with other people. This is um, a slide I sometimes use when I talk about stories. I won't dwell on this. It's very obvious stuff to, to this group, I'm sure. But this captures a lot of the, the difference in, in the corporate world, in the world where I operate. Most of the stories that we are stories that people tell are to sell things or they're, they're kind of, they use jargon or they're very focused around mundane topics, but that's not what stories are. Stories are there to entertain people. Stories are there to captivate people, to take people on a journey. And it's been a real um, shift at Microsoft in the way that we, we do this. You know, historically, we've done lots of the things on the right-hand side, and we're doing more and more of the things on the left-hand side around how do we entertain, how do we create these compelling stories with texture. Um, so I this thought it. Is a Hollywood guidebook for heroes. Has anyone seen this video before I show it? Yes. Some, how many people have seen the video? I'm going to skip the video. Uh, you should go and see the video online, but it's a great little. All right, I'll show the video. I'll, sh I'll show the video, but it just means I'm going to have to talk faster. This is a Hollywood guidebook for heroes. You will learn the secret truth behind most blockbuster movies. They basically all follow the same 12 steps, also known as the hero's journey. Every hero's story starts off with some sort of nobody living in an ordinary world. But by following the right planet, he will get the call to adventure. At first, he can't be too eager. He must refuse the call. Running away from his destiny, he will stumble upon a mysterious old guy who will turn out to be his mentor. Now he's ready to cross the threshold. Where he's going, he doesn't need roads. Of course, he will be tested, and he might need to win the game to gain new allies and enemies. He must overcome his fear by entering the inmost cave. Here, he will face his supreme ordeal, which will change his life forever. After defeating some bad guy, he'll receive his well-deserved reward. And because he can, he will be flying the road back. But before realizing there's no place like home, our apprentice must resurrect as a new person. Eventually, our hero will return to where he started from, 
that things will never be the same again. This is what we call the hero's journey. Okay, so now everybody's seen the video. Everybody's, uh, everybody's seen this movie, right? Has anybody not seen the movie? If you haven't seen the movie, you should leave class now and go and see the movie. <laughs> Star Wars, as we all know, is the best storytelling on the planet. Um, but I show that a little bit because when I show that to people in Microsoft, they say, well, we're not in Hollywood. We're not in the business. And I said, we are. We're in the business of telling stories to entertain people, to captivate people, to take them on a journey. Um, and somebody's calling us from America, but we won't answer this. Could be a good story, though. Uh, this is the way that I, when I arrived in Seattle on the second week of my job, I had no idea what I was doing. I'm not trained as a storyteller. Um, and I tried to figure out a way and approach I could take to tell stories about Microsoft. And this is the approach I came up with. I called it the four Ps. I, was, I will tell stories about people, places, process, or products. But the key to this was taking, always taking at least two of these Ps and combining them to tell a story. So if I was to tell a story about a product like Windows Phone or a PC or Connect or HoloLens, I wouldn't tell the story about the product. I would tell the story about the place where it was created, the, the building it was created in, or the process by which it was created. Or I would tell it by the people who created the product. So I would never tell the story the way that you would obviously tell the story. If I was going to tell a story about a person, if I was going to profile a person at Microsoft, I wouldn't really talk about the person. I'd do a profile of the product that they worked on or the place that they created that product. So that served us very well and became the template for a, a website that we launched about uh, three years ago now called Microsoft.com slash stories, forward slash stories. And you can go to this website, and three years ago, we had two stories on this website. We now have about 40 different stories on this website of all different types, profiles of people, uh, uh, profiles of products, uh, the, uh, the impact that technology has had in the world. So I, I'd encourage you to go and take a look at the site. But the site was inspired by this story, by Snowfall. Anybody, people are familiar with Snowfall? So we saw Snowfall at Microsoft four years ago, and we said, this is the way to tell stories digitally. And so I won't um, go through Snowfall in a ton of detail, but it was an incredible story that showed us you could do long-form storytelling as a, uh, as a corporate company, and you could captivate people's attention on the web. This thing was 12,000 words long. It won a Pulitzer Prize, and it's, it's just incredible. It still is. But I read this story from start to finish on the web, when was the last time anybody read 12,000 words start to finish? You know, you start reading something on your, on your computer and then you're distracted by Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or something else. And to be able to captivate people for 12,000 words was incredible. So we sort of took that concept and we, we shamelessly borrowed or stole. So this was the first story that we ever did at Microsoft, the first long form story. And if it looks a little bit like the format of Snowfall, that was no accident. We completely copied Snowfall. Uh, because we love the way that they'd done that. And we were very public about it. We said, hey, we love Snowfall. We don't have as good a story, but we have a story that we think is worthy of the same type of production. So we built this story. We, um, this is a photograph of, uh, this is Microsoft campus uh, in Seattle and across the river. This is, uh, this is downtown uh, Seattle. Um, we found a guy in the company who uh, was both a photographer and had a light aircraft, and he took this photograph for us, which was very kind. But we learned a lot through this um, process of storytelling. And then two years ago, this is our new CEO, and uh, we, we took some of the same uh, principles, the same ideas of how we told a story about a product, and we applied it to a story about our new CEO. The way that in communications and the corporate world that typically when you have a new CEO and you announce that, you typically write a press release and you give it to the media and then they phone people up and ask lots of questions of people like Kiara uh, in our communications department. We said we're going to do this very differently and we put a huge production into announcing and launching our CEO. We treated the launch of our CEO almost in the way that we treated the launch of a product. We produced five different videos. I did a walk and talk interview with the CEO. Uh, we built out an entire website. We did this huge launch, and it was incredibly successful. Not that many media ended up, well, the media phoned up, 
and they said, we're really pissed off because you've done our job for us. Um, because we did such a, a great job of, uh, of taking the product, in this case, being the CEO and, la and launching him. And so what are some of the things that we've learned along the way of, uh, of telling stories? Um, well, the first is, this is very obvious, but most people, certainly most people I work with, they miss this. That you have to start with a great story. And so people will say to me, can we make, uh, can, the, can a product be the hero of the story? And I, I, my answer is I think it's very, very hard. I think the hero of any story really has to be people who've gone on a journey, who've gone on that, you know, the hero's journey. So as an example of that, this is uh, last year on July the 29th, Microsoft released Windows 10, the new version of our operating system. Um, we wanted millions of people to see this and to hear about this. And so typically the way that you do something like that in the corporate world when you launch a big product is that you gather the media in a place or you, you take your CEO and you put him on Fifth Avenue in New York and then you celebrate yourself. You celebrate how great you are and how great your technology is. And we chose not to do that last year. So on July the 29th, our CEO was in the middle of a field in Kenya uh, in a place called Nanyuki and we took this photograph. And uh, the photograph, the, the story behind this is this is um, two, two ladies. Beatrice is the principal of a school in, uh, in this village called Nanyuki, in, in just literally in the middle of Africa. And Tabitha is one of her students. And the reason we took this photograph, the reason we visited this school is to celebrate the impact that technology can have, to tell the story of how impactful technology can be. And the impact here is the, the radio mast on the right-hand side that you see in this image. Uh, it has a, a, the top of the mast is a, a microwave antenna and then a satellite antenna. And then just beneath that, there is a panel that's about this big, and it's called the TV white space antenna. Uh, it's a piece of technology invented by Microsoft. And then out here in the distance, you can't really see it, there's a hillside, a mountain range, that's about 15 kilometers away. Now, think about the Wi-Fi antenna that you have at home or that you have around here in the buildings. It's probably about the size of this book, maybe a little bigger and it has a range of about 15 meters. This Wi-Fi panel on the mast over here, it has a range of 15 kilometers. And so two years ago, we installed this radio mast in the middle of Kenya, and now 30,000 people in this village have access to the internet. Tabitha here, she will end up going to university because of that radio mast, because now she has access to the internet, and she has access to the level of education and the online education that we all have access to. And so the story that we told that day was not a story about ourselves or a story about our product. It was a story about the impact of technology in the world. And so inside Microsoft, when I say to people, you have to start with a great story, I tell them stories like that one to say the stories we really should be telling to change the business I am in is to change people's perception of Microsoft. And if we tell more stories like that one, we will change people's perception. Another um, lesson we learned is that in storytelling, you really are in the image business. So as much as you know, we all, I'm sure, in this room enjoy writing, enjoy the craft of writing, enjoy journalism, enjoy you know, the aspiring to be a novelist, it's also the world we live in today is a very, very visual world. It's no surprise that Pinterest and Instagram are two of the biggest websites on the internet. Because that old adage that a picture tells a thousand words is even more true today because the world we live in, we're bombarded with information. And that's why images done well can really tell a story. So this was an image we took on the day that we announced uh, our CEO. Um, so you may recognize uh, at least one person on this image, uh, Bill Gates over here. So we have three CEOs in the history of the company, Bill Gates, Steve Ballmer, and our new CEO, Satya Nadella. And the story behind this image is uh, this was on the day we announced our CEO in, in February 6, 2004. We had a big event at our offices in Seattle and all of the employees were there and there was lots of excitement and lots of energy. And I, I, had a, I now have a photographer who works in my team. And I said to the photographer, I'd really like this image of the three CEOs standing together, Satchit in the middle, two CEOs on the side, uh, and I'd like them all to be smiling, and I gave him the challenge to create this beautiful image that I thought would be a very clean portrait image. And on the day, I realized that the image would be very hard to get. It was a very busy room. 
Anyway, a few hours later, we reviewed all of the photography from that day, and we looked at this image, and we said, this is the most perfect image we could have captured to capture the story of that day. The story was this new CEO being flanked by the two other quite well-known previous CEOs. It captured the energy of the room. It captured sort of the excitement of the room. It also is a very colorful image. So all of these Microsoft Lumia phones in here, we, we hadn't planned that at all. It was just people were taking photographs with their bright red and orange and uh, yellow and white phones. And remarkably, there's not a single iPhone in the image. We, uh, <laughs> we didn't Photoshop this image, I promise. Um, and so we, we knew we had this beautiful image that captured the story of the day. Uh, we could have written a long story about this, but this image captured the story of the day. And a few hours later, the media phoned and said, do you have any photographs that help to tell the story of the day? And we said, yes, we do. And we gave them this image. And this is what happened the next day. That photograph that we had taken sort of accidentally appeared on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. It appeared on the front page of the Financial Times. It appeared on the front page of the New York Times. Every major publication in the world who was reporting on this story used this image that we had accidentally sort of created. And then I won't dwell on this one. Um, another lesson I've learned, this is why me standing up here is so ironic and so funny today, that we also, the storytelling business that we're in, lots of my team work on written stories. We work on visual stories. But we also consider events to be stories or opportunities for us to tell stories. I spend lots of my time now creating large scale events for Microsoft. So I'll show you one of them in a moment. But this was an event we ran two years ago where we invited the media uh, to, to come. There were 150 press came into a room, not much bigger than this, and we announced that we would make Office available on the iPad. It was a big piece of news in our industry. Um, and people wrote about that news, but they also wrote about the event, that we made these very different decisions on that day as to how we would tell that story. So on that day, normally when Microsoft runs an event like that, we create a big room with a big giant stage and we put the CEO on the stage and we have him talk down to people. That day, instead of uh, creating a stage that was normally the stage we would use would be 18 inches high, we said the stage will be two inches high. And it made a real difference in the story because what happened is that the, uh, the media said, you know, it was held in an intimate room where he stood at eye level with the audience. And it changed the dynamic. Because if I stand down here, it now feels, at least for the people at the front of the room, it feels like we're having a conversation. It doesn't feel like I'm giving a lecture. And so we started to change all of these little details around how do we tell our story and think through all of these details and how these, these small changes could create a big perception change. Um, the final one that I'll share with you, again, involves our CEO, and um, unfortunately involves me. Um, that in storytelling as well, you're also, we're in the, much of the time, we're in the entertainment business. We're in the theater business. One of the training courses that we just created internally at Microsoft was a six-day training course taught by a local Seattle theater company. And we brought the theater company in to teach people at Microsoft how to be great storytellers on the stage, how to do improvisation, how to you know, think about the, the stents and how they project their voice, because all of these things to us are part of the storytelling mix. But this, um, this is an example of how we're in the theater business around storytelling. So I'm gonna show you a video that was done about two years ago. It's uh, in front of an audience of about 16,000 people, and it was shot just after, uh, unfortunately, Germany had won the World Cup. So uh, it's not that popular in this room or with me, but I'll show you this video.
the thing I'm really interested in is having my two small children, my right, two-year-old and a five-year-old. And wouldn't it be wonderful if in the lifetime of my mother-in-law, of her grandmother, that they would be able to have a conversation with her in the language, it wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a fly in the language? Wouldn't it, be, <laughs> wouldn't it be wonderful if those two small children could sit there in front of the TV and be able to have a conversation in real time in their language and my mother-in-law to have a conversation in, in her language? So we're going to try and see that in action. Uh, I'm expecting a call any moment now from a friend of mine, Melanie. Melanie is uh, Melanie's German, and uh, she has been uh, celebrating for the last few days, as you can imagine. So uh, any second now, I'm expecting a call from Melanie, and here she is. That was a big sigh of relief. <laughs> I'm here at the Worldwide Partner Conference with 16,000 partners and our CEO on the big stage. So no pressure. That was me the night before. Uh, it's the most nervous I've ever been at Microsoft in 18 years. Uh, because the night before, we did rehearsals, and the technology wasn't working at all. In fact, it, the final rehearsal we did, and I'm conscious this is going to be on camera, but I'll say it anyway. The final rehearsal, I was trying to, I was practicing, and it translated one of my words into F-U-C-K, uh, which is not not very good to do on stage with your CEO and 16,000 people. So most people told me that night, they said, you should never do this demo. Please, please don't do this. It will go wrong. Uh, but it didn't. It went incredibly well. And particularly that the last translation of that very long piece, it translated it almost, almost completely perfectly. Uh, 
And I have to say it was the most relief I've ever had in my life. So those are um, some of the kind of quick lessons I think we've learned around storytelling is we've learned a lot about how to create great digital stories, how to use visuals in stories, but also broaden what we think of as storytelling, much as you're doing here at the school, is that we think about it as being theater. We think about storytelling as entertainment. We think about storytelling taking lots of different mediums. Most recently, we published a book. This is uh, uh, you know, for a company that, that is in the digital realm. We, um, we did something quite different. We published a science fiction uh, book with nine science fiction authors a few months ago, a limited edition book, but nonetheless a book. You can get the book online at microsoft.com slash future visions. Um, and maybe I'll give a copy of the book away today. There's only a thousand of these in the world, depending on the quality of your questions. But three things I will, three things I will leave you with uh, uh, as takeaways, and then we'll have time for questions. Um, have people seen this book or come across this book called Resonate? Yes. Anybody? Yes. Show of hands. Not many. This is a fantastic book on storytelling. Really fantastic book. It's not, uh, it, would nev it never looks like a storytelling book, but Nancy Duarte, she runs, she has a website called duarte.com, D-U-A-R-T-E. Um, and it's a, it's a terrific book on storytelling. Um, on the right-hand side, I've sort of talked about this already, the power of images. The, the biggest lesson we've learned at Microsoft in the last two years is the power of great, great photography. We've invested very heavily in, uh, in photography and visual storytelling. And then the final one in the middle here, is um, somebody asked me earlier today, what do I look for uh, if I'm trying to hire a new storyteller onto my team? What is the skill I look for? Do I look for a great writer or do I look for somebody from a journalistic background or somebody who's written a novel? And all of those things are good. But the thing I look for more than anything is people who have natural curiosity. Uh, so this is a sign in one of the buildings at Microsoft um, that I walked past about three months into my job. I saw this sign, and the sign basically says, giant laser in this, in this, behind this door, please don't come in because it will probably kill you, is essentially what the sign says. And so most people, I think, would walk past the door, and I walked past the door and then turned around and then knocked on the door. And a guy came to the door and opened the door, and I said, who are you? And he said, well, who are you? I said, I'm Steve, I tell stories. He's like, well, I'm Steve as well. I make technology, come in. And I met this unbelievable scientist. He's, he's a distinguished scientist at Microsoft, and he makes amazing, amazing technology, and I've told lots of great stories with him. But I would have never have found this guy had I not been curious to say, well, what's behind the door with the laser? Knock, knock. And so curiosity, I think, is one of the most important skills uh, for a storyteller, and looking for things uh, where you might not expect them is often where you'll find the greatest stories. So I hope some of that was, uh, was interesting. I, uh, I made you laugh a little, which is always, always good. Um, but now I think we have time for questions. So, uh, so thank you, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you guys for, for questions. I'm gonna take a photo of you while you're thinking of questions. Um, so I'm really glad you asked the first question uh, because I haven't, I don't think I've ever really spoken about this before, but I will now. When I moved to Seattle, uh, for the first six months, it was incredibly hard uh, to, to figure out what my job was, to, to, to go around the company and tell people I was a storyteller and that that was my job. People, some people thought it was kind of a joke. Um, and the, it got to a point about six months in, I, uh, I'd built, I, I'd built a website, I'd collected all of these stories, and we were about to publish the stories. And at the point that I was about to publish the stories, there were some of my colleagues who were, um, who were more in the, the public relations, they were in the PR department, 
And they said to me, oh, before you publish the stories, you'll, you have to go and check all of these things with our, uh, and get them approved by legal and approved by the PR department. And I said, but that, that, that's not why I moved here. That's not, I moved here to write great stories that, you know, I've, I think my job is to write great stories and not to have them go through multiple levels of approval. And I remember sitting at home one night and saying to my wife, literally said to my wife, I think I got this wrong. I think we're going to have to pack our bags and move back to London because this isn't the job that I, I was told it was. Uh, and about a week after that, I went out for a, for a beer I, with my boss, Frank. I said, Frank, we need to talk. And uh, all the best stories happen over beer. And um, I sat down and I said to him, listen, Frank, I, um, I'm really sorry, but I think I'm going to have to give this job up. And he said, why? And I said, well, because there are, there are lots of barriers being put in my way to stop me from publishing the stories I want to publish. And I said, that wasn't my expectation. And he looked me in the eye and he said, Steve, just hit the publish button. He said, that's why I invited you and asked you and your family to come here, because you tell great stories and you have my backing and just go and publish the stories. And from that moment on, we did. I never asked anybody. I've never, I don't think I've ever asked anybody for permission to publish a story. But the reason that I've been able to do that is myself and the team is we've built enough credibility with the stories that we've told. Uh, particularly the first story that we told, it was a very uh, surprising success story. And that gave us enough credibility uh, with lots of people at the company to say, these guys actually know what they're doing, so let them just go and do it. Um, so it was, it was very hard. I, if, I hadn't, if I'd have had to go through all of the approvals, I wouldn't do the job. Uh, because it just it removes any of your uh, you know, creative integrity uh, and your authenticity in the story, and the stories just get watered down and become case studies. Um, and then the second question you asked around is, how is success measured? And I've been asked that a few times today, actually, and I sort of, we measure success in kind of three different ways. One is we measure for our digital stories, for example, that we publish on the stories website. We obviously measure how many page views they get, how, uh, how much Twitter traffic, all of the normal things that you would measure a digital story by. And that's interesting, but I, honestly, I don't really care about it that much because I can, I'm, I'm not very technical, but I could easily write a program that would give me all the page views I needed, so it's kind of irrelevant. Uh, the second thing that we measure, which is much more important in my industry, is how much of our stories are being picked up by other people and then retold. Uh, so, you know, are, uh, are other online outlets that we follow, are they using our images, are they using our text? That becomes incredibly important because it means we're in, we are influencing the influencers, as we call it. And then the third measure, which is actually my favorite one, and it goes a little bit back to your first question. The biggest way that we, we measure the stories that we tell really is do we feel good about them? And we won't publish a story unless the team collectively feels proud about the story. We, we published the story yesterday on our website all about, it's called The Invisible Revolution. It's all about the next revolution in technology. And we've held that story back for probably about three months while we've gone through significant editing processes until there's a team of about five people, until the team said, yes, this is now the story we all dreamt it was, and we're proud of the story, hit the publish button. And so our biggest measure really is, do we, uh, do we feel good about reading those stories ourselves? Are we proud of them is, is really our biggest measure. Thank you. You get the book, sir, because you asked the first question. Any other questions? That's a good question. I, let me try and answer it a different way. So we published the first story we ever published. Let me see if I'm online here and I'll show you. It doesn't look like I'm online. The first story we published, um, it was a surprising success. It was all about, uh, um, hang on, let me do this. This is our stories website. And down here is, uh, 
this story, the 88 acre story. So um, when we published this, it was, an, it, was, it was really a test to see if we could do it. And it was incredibly successful by, uh, by a number of measures. Um, it had a quarter of a million page views within 48 hours, and it generated um, many, many millions of dollars of business for Microsoft, uh, which we never intended. It was a complete surprise. And so two weeks after this story was published, one of our product teams, so uh, one of the groups inside of Microsoft came to us, and I, I won't tell you which team it is, uh, and they came and they said, we're launching a new product in two weeks' time, and we'd like to do this. Can you help us? We would like to tell a story about the product. And I said, okay, um, well, who is the hero in the story, and what's the journey that they went on, and where is the tension, and where is the conflict? And they said, no, we have this product we'd like to tell a story about. And I said, I know, but who is the hero of the product, and what is the journey, and where is the tension? And they said, I, I don't understand. We have this product, and we'd like to tell a story. And I said, yes, what you need is a website, a marketing campaign, and an advertising campaign. And those things are they're perfectly good. We have lots of people who do that. Um, but that's, that's the difference. And that's why often I say to people, I don't think, uh, I may be proven wrong on this, but I don't think a product can be the hero of a story. Um, and that's where at least my team draws the distinction between advertising and marketing and telling stories. And I, I'm not saying, I don't think advertising and marketing are bad things at all. I do lots of work with our advertising team. And in fact, we've taken lots of the stories that we've created digitally and we've turned them into TV adverts. Um, but the, 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 generally, the disciplines of advertising and marketing and storytelling are, they're still some way apart. Does that answer your question? Yes. Other questions? Sure. For example, the cat translator yep. thing that you show us, you didn't talk about technology, you just show it how it works. So that's the storytelling part. Mm -hmm. Microsoft research, one of the most important research in a state of the art technology in the world, and no one knows about it. They don't really Thank you. The, actual, the actual communication. So my question is why are you not focusing not only in storytelling, how to use the technology, but also scientific divulgation is what thing is happening in this podcast? Because there's one paper. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really good question. I spent uh, most, the first three years of my job when I moved to Seattle, I spent most of my time with the research team because my job really was to tell stories about the future of technology. And I think the reason is if you actually look at most of those papers and it sounds like you've looked at some of them, they're very technically detailed and so they're not really a story. But the what we've, what we've tried to do, and we've tried to do a lot more of this in the last, I would say, the last uh, six months, actually. I have, there is a team that works in my group, four people, and their job is to tell stories about Microsoft Research. But the key to that is not, there are not that many people, I, somebody's already downloaded the book, very good, sir, <laughs> excellent. Um, there are, the challenge with those things is that there, it's actually a quite limited audience of people who, either have the capacity or the desire to read those papers because they're very technically detailed. So what we're trying to do is to shift the Microsoft research storytelling to say, let's show you the, the impact of that technology. So if you give me a moment, I'll give you an example of this. Uh, if we can, depends how good our connection is. Okay, I'm gonna show you another video. So a little quick story behind this video. So about um, three weeks ago, Microsoft ran, uh, we had our, probably one of our biggest conferences of the year. It's called Build. It's held over three days in San Francisco. 8,000 people attend this conference. And part of my job these days is to help write speeches uh, and create technical demos for our CEO. So he will do these big demos like the one you saw on stage. And as we put together his speech for this event, um, 
we had a piece of technology that we wanted to talk about, and all of this technology came from Microsoft Research. And it's technology that allows computers to recognize a person, recognize a person's age, recognize the emotion of a person. It's some very detailed technology. And so one of the ways that we could have told that story is to say, hey, look at all of this exciting technology. It can recognize age and emotion. And, and we decided not to do that. We decided to show the impact of the technology. So rather than trying to sell the technology, we said the story we need to tell is what is the impact this technology can have. So let me show you the video that we, um, we put together and we used during the keynote. Uh, Hopefully our connection works. Let's see. Maybe not. Okay, maybe the video will come. Here it comes, here it comes. All right, I'm gonna wait for the video to buffer and if it buffers enough, I'll show you the video. But it's an incredible uh, video that, um, well, we'll wait and see. So we'll see if there's another question and maybe we'll come back to the video. What about uh, virtual reality? Mm -hmm. Virtual reality. So is there an Oculus, uh, is it is possible to make storytelling with virtual reality? Yeah, I think virtual reality with Oculus and augmented reality, we have uh, HoloLens. People seen HoloLens? So uh, that's an amazing technology. I had the chance to play with that. They are going to be incredible uh, tools for telling stories. And so one of the ways that I would like to use HoloLens is um, uh, every month we invite people, we invite journalists, reporters to come to Microsoft and to experience Microsoft. Uh, and we invite reporters from all over the world. But that's an expensive thing for them to do, an expensive thing for us to do. So one of the ways I would like to use that technology is to create a virtual tour of the Microsoft campus. So I would love to come back here in two years or a year and give you all a HoloLens and you can put it on and you can walk around Microsoft and you can see the door with the laser and you can knock on the door. That's, I think it's gonna be this incredible canvas and tool for telling stories. My only caution on it is it's not gonna replace the craft of storytelling. So you still have to start with a great story and then use the technology to tell the story. Um, and I worry a little that people will get so seduced and so excited by the technology that they'll forget that actually you can have the best technology in the world, but nothing replaces a great story. But it's super cool technology. The HoloLens is incredible. I took it home a few months ago. I, they loaned me one for the weekend. And I took it home. My wife does not like technology. She's not a fan of technology. And I put the headset on. And she was ripping the headset off me and said, no, I'm going to put the headset. She put the HoloLens on. And my wife is, uh, she's an architect. And she could immediately see the potential for this technology, that she could uh, basically experience a 3D uh, you know, holographic version of a building before the building had even been built. Um, so I, it, it was, it's just incredible technology. One of the things I did is you, you put the headset on and then you can create a holographic image. So I imagine I put this thing on and then I, I created a holographic image of one of the characters from Halo and he was just floating in the room here. And then you walk away and you walk over here and you come back and just, oh, it's still there. It's still floating in the room. It's quite impressive. This video is still loading. So any more questions while the video still loads? No more questions. It's good. I'll have some more water. This isn't water. This is vodka, by the way. <laughs> questions, questions. They are shy. How can you sell yourself as a storyteller, you mean? Um, I think, let me try and answer it this way. If I, was, if I was to leave Microsoft tomorrow and go to another company, a big or a small company, 
I think obviously in the, in the same way that you, you, know, you sell your skills, you, you, you write them down on a CV or a resume and you show people. Um, the beauty of storytelling is that you can show people. You can say, you know, here is the work I've done, here is the impact I've had. Uh, I, think, I think it's much, e well, not much easier, it's easier now than it was a few years ago. Um, you know, when I first started and I said to people I was a storyteller, they, they laughed. They were like, what's a storyteller? That, that's a silly word. You, are, are you a blogger or you a, are you a writer? And I was like, no, I'm a storyteller. And I thought it was different. Now I think there's more of an, uh, a recognition and an appreciation of, um, of storytelling and people understand more what it is. But I think really, you know, a storyteller, you have to be able to, to show people work that you've done that is that demonstrates that you have the ability to tell stories whether that's you know a, a book or a video or a, a story on a website or something that you've done and and that's the beauty of it is you can show people the uh, the impact what are the um, steps in the process of creating a story like finding the good story as you said before and then Mm -hmm. So let me tell you, it's a, it's a great question. Let me tell you two different types of stories we create. The first is a, how we go about creating some of these online digital stories. And then the process for creating something like uh, a keynote, a presentation like the one that we did. And so the first one, um, really, the, the st we're now very fortunate that the stories tend to find us. People come to our team and say, hey, we'd love to tell a great story. But it's, e it's either that or probably more often we just we get to know great people at the company. And great stories really start with great people. So, um, for example, we told a story. Uh, let me think of a good example. Um, we really just identify a person and then we basically interview that person. And then we ask that person, who are all of the other people who are the people in the story? And we go and interview them. And we, so we interview all of the people and we put together a sort of a, a very brief first draft of the story. And the team then gets together and has a brainstorm and says, how are we going to tell this story? Uh, how many chapters will it have? You know, what is the best way that we can, um, you know, what is kind of the length of the story? What is the arc of the story? So we do all the classic, you know, thinking about how do you create a story? And once we have that, we then think about what are the assets that will help illuminate the story. So do we need photography? Do we need video? We've made lots of use of illustration. Uh, do we need illustrators? Uh, so then we start to uh, put together the creative assets. And most of the stories that we tell uh, use all of those things. Mo most of the stories that we create on that website take somewhere between one and three months to create the entire story and all of the assets. And then those stories cost, probably the most inexpensive story we've told was maybe $5,000 to create the story, create the website, create all of the visuals. The most expensive story we've told on that website is probably $150,000. Um, and it was, it was worth the investment, it had a huge impact. We won a, a Guinness World Record uh, because of the story. Um, so that's how sort of the process that we do for the digital stories. The process for the, the keynotes, these big theatrical productions, they're quite different. So, uh, for example, last night at 9 o'clock, I was on the telephone uh, with a group of 12 people back in Seattle with our CEO, and we were brainstorming the next event he has, which is in two weeks' time. And the way that process tends to work is that we come up with a, very, with a single slide, a single PowerPoint slide, that has, here's, here's the story. Th those things, those uh, keynotes are normally about anywhere between 30 minutes and an hour long. And on a single slide, we say, here's the story and how the story is going to play out. And I, I can show you one of the scripts in a second. It's, and then we turn that into a longer script that has each of the chapters, and then it has visuals against each of the chapters. And then we start to say, what are the technical demonstrations we can make uh, that will illuminate each of these chapters? In the same way we, we add video and illustration and photography to a digital story, we add physical demonstrations to these keynote stories. And though they, that process is normally um, involves, it starts out with a broad group of people. It normally has somewhere around 20 people. And then it becomes a very small group of normally about six people working closely, in, in this case, with the CEO. 
uh, and they normally take about anywhere between one month and three months to, to create those stories as well. Uh, but it's, it's a pretty intense process. How long do the um, websites stories take? The, the, they're different. Let me show you, if we go back to the website, we generally do two different types of stories on the web. Um, there are stories like this one, which is a profile of, um, of a, a lady at the company called Kiki. Her name is Kiki Wolfkill. That's her real name. It's such an awesome name. Uh, Kiki works in our Xbox team and she creates, she's the executive producer of Halo, the, the game Halo. And, uh, but the story is not at all about Halo. If you go back to my four Ps at the start, we could have told a story around Halo and we decided not to because the, there's a giant website where you can find out about Halo. But we thought the story around Kiki was very interesting. She, um, she's an ex-racing car driver. She used to race Porsches uh, competitively. Uh, if the page opens, you'll see there's some beautiful visuals and photography. Those stories, the profiles, take probably anywhere between two weeks and a month uh, to write. You'll see the story come up. So it's, um, and we have videos in. We have some great photography of Kiki and her Porsche. We have some stuff on Master Chief. She wears very high heels. Um, so that story is probably about 1,500 words, and it takes probably about um, somewhere between three to six weeks to create the story. Really, that becomes very dependent on, on the photography. Whereas, uh, we take a look at another story. Uh, let me find one. I'll load this story. This will take a moment to load. This story took about three months, and probably it wasn't the most expensive story that we did, but it cost quite a lot of money because we created some very bespoke uh, visuals inside of the story to help bring the story to life. So they, um, the shortest period of time is probably about three weeks. The longest period of time is probably about six months. Let's see how I've, uh, This is the story. It has these... Um, very beautiful visuals in. So we, we found a group of really great designers that we work with, uh, not inside of Microsoft, outside of Microsoft, and they build these, these fantastic visuals that help to support the story, and they just take a long time to create the visuals. I don't think our video is going to load, unfortunately, but uh, I'll keep, keep trying. More questions, excellent. <laughs> Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the company I admire the most is uh, Red Bull. Red Bull do incredible storytelling. They are blessed with some really great uh, assets to be able to tell those stories. So they have, you know, people who fly. They told her they did a great video last week where there was a, uh, I think it was shot in Europe, a guy in the Red Bull plane, and he was flying in between. The, uh, the big windmills uh, that are used to, to create energy. So he was flying a plane between those. We don't have planes or windmills at Microsoft. Um, and they have, uh, they have lots of great athletes, and they have lots of great high-octane things like a Formula One racing team. But they, um, despite all of that, they do very, very good storytelling. Uh, GE is another company who is a very large company, bigger than us. Um, and they do, they do fantastic storytelling. We're, we're, we've become quite close friends with the storytelling team at GE. And they do some similar things to us, uh, but I admire what they do because they work, the company is huge and they work on a very broad set of products. Uh, they do great work. Uh, another company I admire in the US, the storytelling they do is Chipotle, uh, a fast food company. They do these very cool animated little cartoons. Um, I'm trying to think. Apple do, yeah, we can mention Apple. Uh, we've, got, uh, we've got plenty of them in the room here. Um, I, think, I think Apple do do, you know, they do some great storytelling. He was definitely a storyteller, yeah. Uh, he was better than me, that's for sure. Um, a lot better. Uh, they, I think they do do some great storytelling. They, what they do, what I think we do differently 
uh, to Apple, and it's up to other people to decide which is best. They tend to make the, the, the product the hero of the story. So the hero is always the device, uh, whether it's the iPad or the iPhone or the iMac. And they, I, I love the equipment. They make amazing stuff. I have an iPad. I have an iWatch. I have all of the Apple stuff. And I'm allowed to talk about them. Um, <laughs> here's my iPhone. But that's my Windows phone as well. <laughs> uh, and so I, I think they're, a, they're an amazing company who do phenomenal work. Uh, they just they approach their storytelling different to us. They have very iconic products that they choose to make the product the hero. We, the work we do, we, trend, we tend to try and make the, the people the heroes of the story. I will say, hang on a second. I'm going to do a, I'm going to, I'm going to do, a, ooh, I'm going to do a demo for you. See, um, so this is my Surface Book, and I like Apple products, but they can't do this. Um, so I'll answer the question a few ways. I think, I think journalism is already using these approaches. You know, uh, to go back to this previous question, an organization who I think probably does some of, if not the best online storytelling is the New York Times. They are absolutely, Snowfall was phenomenal. But Snowfall is just, that was just the beginning for them. They told the story uh, last Sunday. They did an online story and a print story around Minecraft. Uh, but they, they are just incredible storytellers who, you know, we, we basically copy the New York Times a lot of the time. And, you know, the, so journalism is already using these techniques. Um, and then inside of Microsoft, despite all of the things I've said around, hey, you need great visuals and you, you don't always necessarily need people who are from a journalism background, when we started to build our storytelling team, which is probably about 20 people now, uh, probably the first three people that we hired were journalists because you still need great, great writing. Uh, so we have, uh, I think, three now award-winning journalists uh, that work in our team creating stories. And we mix them up um, you know, with people who come from a theater background, people who come from a photography background, people who come from a... Uh, we have people in the team who come from a background in, in Hollywood in making movies. We have people who come from all kinds of different backgrounds. But, we still do invest heavily in having great, great writing talent, real proper, you know, trained journalists on the team. We could turn the camera off. Uh, um, I, most of the time, I, will, I say to people that I get paid to do my hobby. Like I, would, uh, I wouldn't quite do this for free, but I would do it for a lot less money than I get paid. I'm, I'm a very, very lucky man that I get to work for a company that I admire. I get to work for uh, people that I admire hugely. I get to tell stories without any real boundaries. Nobody, nobody said to me, Steve, you can't go and create a book. Uh, we just went and created a book. Um, nobody said to me, you can't build websites like you've built. You can't, you can't create videos like the, we have a, I, we, my team, we have a huge amount of freedom. So on a scale of one to 10, I would say I'm probably a nine. Um, and that's only because I'm constantly looking for what is the next thing that we can do? How can we push ourselves? The next thing, I told a few people this today, the next thing I would like to create is, uh, as a storytelling device is a, a record, a vinyl record. Uh, because I do think there's this very interesting, um, a little bit of a shift back to analog in the storytelling world. That's why we created a book, is because we thought we could get people's attention by creating an analog device in a very, very digital world. 
Uh, and so we created over the last year, we, we created a number of podcasts. We experimented with podcasting as one way to tell stories. And it wasn't as successful as we hoped it would be, um, but the content is still really good. It just didn't get to the right people. And so we have this idea to say, can we take the podcast and put it onto a vinyl record and then deliver that to people and create an element of surprise because vinyl is hugely on the rise. Um, so I'm very satisfied with the job. And then on the Jay Carney question, uh, I, I, I think it's fascinating. I think, uh, you know, I have a guy that I work with who sits, uh, sits about three desks away from me and he used to work in the Clinton administration. Uh, so there are a number of people from that kind of background who are in these types of roles, typically who come from, uh, lots of the people actually who work around me are professional speech writers, who write speeches for our executives, and a good number of those have come previously from political backgrounds. And the reality is it's, it's a great training ground for writing you know, incredibly good content. Uh, going back to that, the book I mentioned earlier, Nancy Duarte's book, Resonate, in that book, she breaks down three or four different uh, sto moments of big storytelling and explains why they are great stories. One of them is she breaks down Star Wars and says, here's why Star Wars, as much as we joke about it being a great story, it really, really is a great story. And she shows exactly why and, and has a, a device in the book she uses to explain why it has all of the elements of a great story. She also um, breaks down Steve Jobs' iPhone announcement and explains why that was a great story. She uses a technique called spark lines and it shows where there is a very, very methodical and a very well thought out cadence to that announcement and to that story. And then the other one that she, she breaks down and looks at is um, when the, there was the space shuttle disaster many years ago and Ronald Reagan made a very famous speech. She deconstructs that speech and says why this was an incredibly well thought out speech and an incredible story. Uh, so I think there's a lot to be learned from, uh, from the political realm about their ability to create and craft you know, very, very good stories. So it looks like we're, uh, we're gonna wrap up there. Thank you so much, it was a real honor to present to you. Thank you. Enjoy it, that was great. Really enjoyed it.